Well, good morning, uh, everyone. It's uh, an honor and a pleasure to introduce an, an old friend, uh, Dr. Hiroki and Nathan, as our WIND seminar speaker today. Professor Nathan holds the Chair of Photonic Systems and Displays in the Department of Engineering at Cambridge University. He received his PhD in Electrical Engineering from the University of Alberta and following postdoctoral years at LSI Logic Corp in the United States and ATR Zurich in Switzerland, he joined the University of Waterloo, where he held the Dalsa NSERC Industrial Research Chair in Sensor Technology and subsequently Canada Research Chair in Nanoscale Flexible Circuits. And uh, in 2001, he was the recipi recipient of the prestigious NSERC EWR Stacey Fellowship. Now, for those of you who are, who are students, uh, you may be interested to know that uh, Arokia was one of the founding fathers of the nanotechnology engineering uh, program, which some of you were enrolled in, together with others who are here, including Dr. Tony Vanelli, who's the uh, Dean of Engineering at uh, the University of Guelph now, and uh, Vasily Karanasius, who's a professor in the chemistry department. In 2006, uh, Dr. Nathan moved to the UK to take the Sumimoto Chair of Nanotechnology at the London, London Centre for Nanotechnology, which is at University College London. And there he received the Royal Society Wolfson Research Merit Award. He has held uh, visiting professor appointments at the Physical Electronics Laboratory at ATR Zurich and the Engineering Department at Cambridge. <coughs> Rogi has published over 400 papers in the field of sensor technology, CAD, and thin film transistor electronics. He is also a co-author of four books, has over 50 patents filed and awarded, and has founded or co-founded four spin-off companies. Dr. Nathan has served also on many technical committees, conference committees, and editorial boards, for example, of IEEE and the uh, Materials Research Society in various capacities. He is a chartered engineer in the United Kingdom, fellow of the Institute of Engineering and Technology in the UK, a fellow of the IEEE in the USA, and he was an IEEE EDS Distinguished Lecturer in 2004. So please join me in welcoming uh, Dr. Roki and Nathan, whose, whose uh, talk is entitled Transparent Oxide Semiconductors, Will They Ever See the Light? Roki. Yeah, thank you. thanks, thanks, Arthur. I uh, don't know if you should have the front dimmed or is it okay like this? No? Yes, give it much more than that. Oh, that's it, yeah? I've been hit, here, yeah. Uh, <laughs> hit the limit. Okay, <laughs> thank you very much. Uh, huh? Your mic's not on? Yeah, can you hear me at the back? Or? Yeah. Okay. Okay, so uh, Asa, thank you very much for a very generous introduction and uh, it's a pleasure to uh, come back here, especially in July because it was in 1989 I first joined the university. It was a really hot summer like this, so I have uh, good memories then, you know. <laughs> so, um, um, so my presentation today is on uh, transparent oxide semiconductors, and I think, uh, I think uh, Arthur, I think you have invited uh, the big man in this area, was Hosono, who I, I believe who's come here and spoken about oxide semiconductors. And uh, uh, prior to him, I mean, the, uh, the uh, Japanese did do a lot of work on, uh, on uh, oxide semiconductors, but crystalline oxide semiconductors. And this man had a wisdom, you know, to try and create amorphous versions of it and created, you know, the combinations of binary alloys that would give you the amorphous material. And the amorphous material, believe it or not, is as good as a crystalline material. It's quite unusual. So, uh, and since then, you know, companies are, you know, particularly Samsung and a variety of other companies are uh, basically going gangbusters on, on, on these oxide materials. Now they are transparent, or they, they are said they are transparent. Uh, and uh, what I thought I'd try and say is, you know, focus on one aspect of it. I mean, uh, they are transparent, but can we make them see? Can we make them, you know, absorb, for example? And will they ever make it into a product? So this is what I meant by will they ever see the light? So. Right, so let me just, you know, for, for, for just for very basic uh, general introduction, give you some examples of amorphous oxide uh, tra uh, uh, transistor displays. This displays is one area where they are quite popular because people are interested in, you know, sh showing uh, see-through screens and so on. So you have a layer that's sitting beneath the active, you know, uh, display layer, and uh, basically that layer forms where, where the electronics is. So, so people have demonstrated all kinds of devices. 
uh, transparent flexible transistors because a, a lot of these processes are sputtered. So you can, if, if you're using a sputtering process, uh, you can virtually, I mean, you can deposit them at, at, at room temperature. So, and the temperatures that, that come up to are basically, you know, the temperatures that, that are involved in the, uh, in the sputtering process or in the plasma. So, so uh, plastic substrates or PET substrates can very easily do that. So, so people have demonstrated that. They've made uh, black and white flexible e-paper. E-paper is, you know, the e-ink based uh, type product. It's a Kindle. And they have demonstrated this. And they've also shown, you know, sort of different driving arrangements for that. AM LCDs is one big area where transparent oxides are being really, uh, you know, chased after because their mobilities are better than thin film silicon. So what people like is to say, okay, my, uh, you know, if I can get a higher mobility material, I can then integrate all the, uh, you know, all the peripheral electronics around the display as well, because uh, you know, and I can still maintain reasonably good frame rate. So, so that's one of the reasons why you know there's big interest in it's used in displays. And of course, we all know the organic light emitting diode display, which itself is a transparent material. So, so this is one of the big driving forces to show transparent screens. So all these very nice uh, examples, uh, they were all presented you know in a Nature paper, Nature Asia, Asia at Materials by Kamiya, who's who's uh, working in the same lab as, 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 as Osono. Right, so uh, the first thing I'm going to do is, you know, try and draw a contrast with the reference material. The reference material is thin film silicon. So we'll see how the oxide semiconductor compares with thin film silicon. So study in contrast. And then uh, we look at the famous questions that everyone asks when making transistors, right? It doesn't matter what kind of transistors you make. The first question is how stable are they? You know, so we look at uh, stability and particularly the threshold voltage. Uh, how stable is it with light and how fast does it recover? Because for, you know, speed electronics uh, or high speed operation recovery is a very important thing. And then we look at something a bit different. Uh, how do they behave or how do these electrons move around? And uh, TLC is one of the mechanisms, uh, trap limited conduction. And you had uh, Professor Michael Pepper who came here, who's the father, you know, he's from the Mott days and Mott was the one who postulated trap limited conduction. So he does a lot of work. So, so it's interesting that there is an element of trap limited conduction in these materials and uh, depending where the Fermi level positions are, percolation sets in. So, so it's a very nice uh, kind of combination of mechanisms that are there in the, uh, in the material. Then we look at image sensors. How do we then tune the oxide semiconductor to make them absorb in the visible? And uh, so that's, that's how then you can try and develop sensors to, to do imaging. And then I tr thought I'd throw that in uh, because of the fact that they can be deposited at, at low temperature, for example, room temperature, you can make circuits on paper as well. So I'll show you some examples of that. So a lot of this work was, you know, since I left Waterloo uh, five years ago or so, so a lot of this work was carried out um, during my time at London and, you know, more recently at Cambridge. So. So these are the guys, uh, still a PhD student left in London, uh, Sung Sik. And uh, so he continues to work there and he's going to graduate from London as well because they pay him, they fund him, so we don't want to take him away from that. And then, uh, and then our collaborator, Samsung, who's been making the devices for us, doing the arrays. It's very hard in a university environment to show, you know, kind of the uh, Gucci style looking arrays, you know, so Samsung is very good at that. So, but we did a lot of the design and measurements. So. And then uh, uh, the collaborators at Cambridge, John Robertson, who's a, who's a uh, DFT man on oxide, so he's very well known in the area. And uh, this group in Portugal who works on paper substrates. Okay. Right, so let's look at the uh, amorphous silicon and the uh, uh, amorphous oxide semiconductor. So the most, I mean, this is a well-known material, and this is thin from silicon. Uh, you can have that, you know, in the crystalline form, we all know it. That's what makes the Pentium chip for us. Uh, and if you deposit that in thin film form, then you get the amorphous material, which are basically, you know, silicon sp3 type of orbitals, covalently bonded. And uh, what's very important, you know, which, you know, when we grew up learning uh, engineering, engineering anyway, um, all these conduction or transport mechanisms, they, they basically drew, uh, they drew two vertical lines. You know, they said, e, this is EC, this is EV, or whatever. You know, and that was it. But what's really important is the density of states. You know, that completely governs how the uh, material behaves, how its transport mechanisms are, and so on. So if you look at, you know, uh, morphosilicon, because of the randomness in the bonding, you have a lot of tail states. 
And because of this very high density of tail states, trapped limited conduction prevails. So in other words, you know, the, the, the electrons basically jump from uh, one trapped state to another and eventually make it into the conduction band where they then you know, do the conduction. And uh, if you look at this value, these are horrendous values. So this is the density of trapped states at the edge of the conduction band, 10 to the 22. So, and this means that the Fermi level never makes it close to the conduction band. So it's, it gets pinned because of the, such a high density of uh, tail states, which is why the mobilities are also low. Yeah? A lot of the electrons are sitting in traps. They're not there. They don't make it to the conduction band where they you know, conduct freely, etc. So that's why you know, materials like this give you a mobility of one centimeter squared, which is good enough for m many applications because Fortunately, the human is very defective as well, not just the semiconductor, but uh, we don't respond to frequencies higher than 30 kilohertz, so it works very well for displays and human-machine uh, interaction type devices. So uh, if we look at the uh, amorphous oxide semiconductor, so you have the metal cations, and they all have this overlapping structure. This is in the crystalline material. And if you move to the amorphous material, they don't really, you know, they're not really that different. They still overlap. Right? So, they, so you know, the density of tail states are really, I mean, there, there are not many tail states in the, in the, in the, in the band. So, and uh, because of that, you know, tail state densities are a lot lower. They, unfortunately, they're very high for the holes. So whether the, you know, what's interesting is whether you have the crystalline material and or the amorphous material, tail state densities at the valence band are high. So even if you took an amorphous, you know, indium zinc oxide crystalline material, the whole mobilities are very small, in fact, much smaller than thin film silicon. Uh, so that's, that's kind of uh, quite intriguing, you know, in many ways. So, but the tail state densities associated with the conduction band are low, much lower than amorphous silicon. So this is 10 to the 17, 10 to the 19. Now what this means is that, you know, my Fermi level can get into the conduction band. So it actually does just like how you have it in the, you know, in the, in the crystalline material. So, so because of this, um, there is no difference between the amorphous and the crystalline counterpart. So, so, uh, so that's, uh, you know, so, uh, and these materials are generally wide band gap, in generally in excess of three electron volts, very high transparency compared to amorphous silicon. Now, so that's the one important thing to realize. The second is the vacancies, oxygen vacancies. So this is, again, something quite complex. Uh, Canon was the one that sort of pioneered a lot of this work. They had this huge matrix of experiments that tried different materials. And it, and it became clear that you need two binary oxides to create an amorphous state. And, uh, and then you need a third material to control the oxygen vacancies that are present in the material. So uh, the problem with the oxygen vacancies is that they ionize and uh, they create high electron concentrations. And if the concentration of vacancies is high, the concentration of electrons in the material is high, which means that the transistors don't switch off that easily because they're very conductive. So it's a very careful you know, kind of composition that you've got to arrive at to try and have sufficient resistivity you know, or sub, you know, good semiconducting properties you know, for transistor applications. So, so, uh, so, the, so where the oxygen vacancy sits, it sits somewhere here, you know, sort of close to, close to the valence band. But, you know, it very easily ionizes. And when it ionizes, you know, it goes from, you go to singly, singly ionized oxygen, uh, oxygen uh, vacancies, and, uh, and which is a metastable state, but a lot of them end up being doubly ionized. So they sit somewhere here, which is closer to the conduction band. And so because of this, you know, you can fool around with the material and uh, introduce sufficient, uh, uh, sufficient uh, density oxygen vacancies so that you can control the subgap absorption. And that's how you can tune the material to become you know, sensitive to visible light, although its band gap is very large. So, and so these are the examples that I was going to uh, sort of show you. And, uh, and this oxygen vacancies is also the primary culprit for instability in the transistor as well. So when you shine light, you know, you have all these electrons that are, you know, conduct, you know, basically present in the material, and suddenly you get a, this, this very high charge state which changes the threshold voltage of the transistor. And uh, so that gives you the, that's sort of the primary cause of the VT shift. Now the other problem is, so once you shine light and you have this high, nice, very nice photoconductivity, because the whole, whole uh, because the trap density for the, you know, which is high, the trap density is high in the valence band, so a lot of the holes are localized. In other words, they're not free to move at all. So because of that, the electrons don't recombine. And the, 
and the photoconductive state remains in the material. So if you shine light on one of these materials, it takes maybe months, you know, maybe even a year to, re to come back to its original form. So, so that's what we call persistent photoconductivity. And of course, you know, this is a material weakness, so this is where I think good engineering comes in, and you can try and bias it, you know, play around with the gate, gate voltage, to try and get, you know, to try and wipe out this memory that's, that's there in the, in the device. So. so this is just summarizing the, uh, you know, the amorphous and the, the oxide semiconductor. You can see the covalent versus ionic. And the disorder in the amorphous case comes from variation in bond distance or bond angles, while this amorphous oxides are insensitive. And, uh, and, uh, but you do have you know, some fluctuations in the potential at the conduction band, and that's because of this random distribution of metal ions that are present in the material. And this is one of the reasons why you know, when you get into percolation, this becomes an important you know, thing to, to deal with. And uh, all this, because of these you know, fluctuations, you, the material you know, starts, uh, the electrons in the material starts percolating. So. And, uh, and so, you know, the, I think the rest I basically uh, talked about. And finally, when you talk about instability in the, in the amorphous case, in the silicon case, you just have charge trapping. And, uh, and you're, you worry about defect creation. Defect creation is you know, when you have sync <coughs> silicon dangling bonds, and the hydrogen in the material basically goes and passivates this dangling bond, while in the amorphous case, it's oxygen. That's, that's the uh, culprit for the defect creation. Right, so, uh, so generally, so, now, so, why, uh, so why do we do all this? So the one exciting area is to try and layer electronics on flexible substrates. So plastic is very exciting. And more and more, you know, people want to wear them. Uh, people want to move away from body wearable computers. They want patches that you can, you know, put on your body or body area networks. And these things shouldn't have wires. So wires are again a disadvantage. So you want systems that can transmit, receive information, you know, to whatever the hub is. Could be your smartphone. And uh, you also want to make sure that this material, you know, these devices don't need a, a battery. So they got to be able to, or you know, they don't need the con that conventional battery. They could have a, a little storage element that's, you know, a thin film battery on a flexible substrate, and uh, you want the system to be autonomous. So, so these are the primary requirements that's driving flexible electronics now. And you know, Europe certainly has put a lot of money in this area, and they're talking about, you know, having such kind of laminated devices on packaging, food packaging, where you monitor temperatures that the meat's exposed to. You're looking at, you know, uh, pharmaceuticals. You want to also have a good record of the sort of temperature cycling that the drug has gone through, et cetera, et cetera. So, so a lot of exciting application areas. And, uh, and so which means that you need to, dis you know, kind of develop the sensors, you need to develop the energy storage, energy management, and you need to have RF or wireless capability. So. So all of these means that you need good mobilities. So this is why the oxides are viewed as an attractive material. So. And uh, also, because it's a plastic substrate, you can have them processed at low temperatures. So. And uh, I'll just, you know, this is just a summary of a lot of information here. I'm not going to go through all of them, but it, it shows you, right, all the key competitors. So you have organic, you have the organic material, uh, that typically gives you a mobility, which is the same as uh, thin film silicon in the amorphous case, which basically is the standard material for all your laptop screens. And then you have nanocrystalline, which is still in the roadmap for many, many companies. In other words, texturing the silicon to give you a better performance. And then you have the polysilicon, which is, you know, requires some sort of post-processing, like excimer laser annealing, etc. And then you have the oxides. So, so this sort of summarizes, you know, all of the essential kind of uh, attributes or process requirements that you need. And regardless of uh, uh, whatever you do, whatever system you make, you need a certain degree of compensation. So this is where the electrical engineers come in. They have to say, okay, my material has a certain weakness. How do I now design circuits to try and stabilize this, to try and make them work, right, even under extreme conditions? I, how do I compensate? Uh, and how do I provide that stability that the device needs? So. So, and they all do that because these are all sort of disordered materials by definition, so. 
Right, so let's, let, let's look at typical device structures. So I'm going to just sort of show you, you know, the sort of uh, device structures we use for this sort of experiments. So we normally use a glass substrate, and we have these all bottom gate transistors. And you have the first layer that you put on is the gate material, which is molybdenum typically. And that's used quite widely in all of the display technologies. Yeah? So, and then you have this layer of uh, silicon oxide. And uh, although this whole device, I mean, there are a lot of people claiming that I can do this entire device at room temperature, the sort of materials you get, you know, as dielectrics at room temperature, the poor quality. So, so this is one of the uh, disadvantages. So, so still a lot of work is needed to try and replace this low temperature silicon oxide. So one of the exciting, one of the exciting deposition schemes that you can that have, you know, stayed very dormant for many years, but suddenly, you know, thanks to the CMOS guys, you know, the Pentium people, they have come up with very nice scalable atomic layer deposition tools, which are also even roll to roll. So, so suddenly ALD has become a very promising, you know, deposition tool. And it's, you know, people have tuned processes to give you sufficient uh, growth rates, etc. So, so this is something that, you know, uh, is very, very nice and is very promising because these devices are very thin film devices. I mean, the active channel layer, which is this, this layer here, is very thin. It's about 100 nanometers or less. So, so the electrons that you see that go from source to drain, conduct this way, constantly interact with these interfaces. So, so the, the dielectric and the passivation layers are extremely important. That's the one problem. The second problem is, this is uh, the, the passivation layer as well. So you need a very good quality material for the passivation because these are oxide materials. You get oxygen in the air, moisture, and there is a degradation issue. Unlike silicon from silicon, oxides are believed to degrade. And uh, to, to really show good results on oxide transistors, you've got to really do really some, some tests. Or, you know, you've got to really test and characterize them in environment chambers, which nobody does. Or even if they do, they don't show it because the results are not encouraging. So, so, you know, so there are a lot of, still a lot of fundamental issues process-wise that need to be tackled before you see a device like this making it into the, the market. So. So, uh, but, but you get good mobility, so, so let me explain something here. Uh, this is a gallium indium zinc oxide, you know, it's a gizo, we call it. And that's sitting on top of a indium zinc oxide, gizo. And uh, the reason we use a bilayer is because indium zinc oxide is full of oxygen vacancies. Yeah, so electron concentrations are good, they give you very good conduction properties. Right? And that also helps you shape the, the threshold voltage. So values we're getting is 1.4. So they, they work very nicely in enhancement mode at positive VG. And without that, the VG has to be negative. So they actually switch on at minus half a volt, minus one volt, which you don't want. It's very hard to design logic with a negative switching threshold. So, so it's very nice to be able to, you know, have the, uh, the, you know, to introduce the ICO to have the appropriate switching voltages. And uh, so, that's, so that's the oxygen-rich material. And then your gizo and the introduction of gallium suppresses vacancies in the ICO. So, and that becomes the sort of the layer that conducts the you know, electrons for you or basically uh, you know, forms the interface, which is a kind of a heterojunction. And you, know, you, get, you get mobilities of 70 centimeters squared, and et cetera, et cetera. So, so the bilayer is very critical for having this positive threshold voltage. And, uh, and then when you subject this device to both bias stress and light stress, you can see that you know, in the dark, the stability is excellent because you know, the, uh, you're not you know, firing up these oxygen vacancies. And uh, so you get you know, um, at, at extreme positive bias stresses of 20 volts and, and so on, you get some shift in the threshold voltage, which is basically trapping of charge in the dielectric, which happens to have a very fast release time constant. So the recovery with these things, you know, with this kind of trapping mechanism is fast. So these are very fast interface states. So electrons go sit in these interfaces and very quickly come out. Time constants are short. So that's not an issue at all. But when you shine light, then this is where the problem is. You get this double, doubly ionized oxygen, and you have all these electrons in the material, and these electrons don't recombine, they stay there. And uh, that gives you huge shifts in the threshold voltage. So, so that's, one of the, that's the, sort of the primary instability mechanism that's, that's there, and uh, especially in the presence of light. So, uh, 
So you can see now, the, one of the most important things when you use them in arrays, you know, you, you know, all arrays go through these frame rates and they sort, you know, so you want to be able to drive them at a certain, you know, frames per second. And so recovery of the device, you know, after you have stressed it is very important. So this shows you both stress and recovery and you can see that, um, you know, with the light stress, you know, the recovery is extremely so. so. And uh, with just dark stress, recovery is much faster. So. So visible illumination leads to a shift in threshold voltage, a negative shift, regardless of the bias polarity. And uh, so this is very clearly because you've introduced a lot of electrons in the channel, so that gives you the shift in negative direction. And uh, a significant ionization of V0. Um, and uh, whereas, you know, you have negligible charge trapping and, uh, and, and, and so on. So, so if you then took the expression for the threshold voltage, you have the charge trapping term. So this charge trapping describes how much electrons have gone, you know, overcome the band offset and got energetic enough to, to get trapped in this dielectrics or passivation layer. And then you have the defect creation, which is pretty much the, uh, the uh, you know, the, uh, which is very dominant in the amorphous case, not so much in the oxides. And then you have the ionized oxygen vacancies, which are sitting there, which contribute to the instability. So let's look at you know this this so-called persistent photoconductivity. So, so uh, so you know so the material on its own you know has all these oxygen vacancies sitting there, close to the valence band, and then you uh, you know so basically they are neutral oxygen vacancies, and uh, under light they become you know shallow ionized uh, donors and they basically dope the channel. They create anti-doping in the channel. And, uh, and then, you know, so, so you can have, you can see these doubly, doubly ionized uh, levels sitting over there. And, uh, and, uh, and basically, uh, you know, this is due to the, I mean, that I was, I was explaining that, you know, the singly ionized is metastable, so the du doubly ionized is the sort of the stable state. And, uh, and this basically, because the holes are localized, you have these electrons then that, that are sitting in the material, so which then give you the negative shift. So. And so what do we do then? So you have all these electrons you know, that have been created by, by you know, induced by light. And uh, so we tried various you know, measurement schemes. And uh, you have these electrons that are sitting there. This is where the oxygen vacancy level is, the ionized oxygen vacancies. So in the one case, you, you, know, you had a uh, uh, positive. Okay. Yeah, sorry about that. Okay, so in one case you you know, you, bi you bias it with a positive gate pulse, and you can see what happens is uh, you know you uh, here's where you have the light that's on, and then the, basically you switch the light off, and then when you bring the positive gate pulse, basically you reset the whole system. So what you're doing is you're bringing the Fermi level way up. You know, you're basically pushing the Fermi level up, and uh, you're forcing a, the electrons to recombine with the holes. So, so that sort of wipes out the memory. So this, so this is the kind of the biasing arrangement that we're using. And if you, if you look at the, uh, you know, if you look at the negative gate pulse, that brings the Fermi level even closer to the valence band. You, you don't see that happening, and you can see that the photocurrent just remains high. And the same thing when you, sorry, same thing when you have a, uh, um, a constant gate pulse as well. So, so, so this is so this is quite interesting. So, uh, so what we uh, so when we looked at this, we said, oh, this is quite interesting because uh, I can basically then do you know various heights of you know of the gate pulse, and I can tell exactly where the oxygen vacancies are sitting. So in a kind of a spectroscopy. So this is so this is the kind of series of experiments we are currently doing. So and this is nice in a way as well because because of the fact that you eliminate the that photocurrent that was created, uh, you can then use such a scheme to then create fast imaging as well. So you can introduce oxygen vacancies, but by introducing a, a very fast gate pulse, I can wipe out the memory effects and I can do fast imaging with it. So. Right, so coming back to uh, uh, the material, so I was showing you a bit of density of states earlier, so uh, you can see what happens. So this is the, the oxide semiconductor. You can see the tail states. Uh, 
so the black, the black lines uh, show you what amorphous silicon is, and the blue shows you what the oxide semiconductor is, and you can see the, where the oxygen vacancies are sitting. So, uh, and if you look at the, the uh, oxide semiconductor, uh, you can see that in this region, you, you have this random distribution of, of the metal ions, like gallium and zinc and so on, and this gives you the so-called, you know, the, so the age of the conduction band isn't quite clear. You have these perturbations in the energy or, the, or, or you know, at the conduction band. So, uh, so anything below the conduction band minima, which we define as E sub M here, uh, uh, this is what's very dominant in the amorphous material, and that's what gives you trap-limited conduction. Uh, I'll show you a little bit more of this. And anything above the minima, conduction band minima, you get this so-called so percolation conduction. So this sort of describes you uh, the, uh, the scenario that's taking place. So if you take the material, uh, and let's say this is where the Fermi level was sitting, these are all the occupied, you know, sort of localized tail states that, that are there. And so you have all these traps, and basically what happens is the electron can go up there, come down, sit down there for a while, go up, go back up again, and so on and so on. So you have, so this is what's defined as trap limited. So if the trap densities were high, then you know, the electron doesn't really sit up there, but spends more time in the traps. Yeah. And, uh, and if you move the Fermi level to much higher levels, then, of course, the electron spends more time up here. And these are the barriers I was talking about. You know, this sort of random distribution of potential that's associated with, uh, or the, uh, the potential associated with a random distribution of metal ions. So, so uh, and, and, and you can see, so this is uh, the oxygen vacancy, so these are the sites that are sitting. And you can then, you know, describe the mobility in the material. The mobility in the material is not a scattering limited mobility. It's, it's mobility that's a function of the traps that are sitting there. So, so this is the, uh, the, you know, the time constant associated with the uh, free conduction versus, you know, the time that, you know, the electrons basically, or the total time, is, you know, the trap trap time constant plus the, that associated with the free conduction. And this is the, uh, you know, mobility that you have in the, in the conduction band itself. So that gets scaled by this value. And if the trap densities were large, what you'll, what you'll have is you have a huge number here. So then, you know, so that's, that's, that's will, that will dominate conduction in the material. And if they were small, then, you know, you have a, a mobility that's very close to the conduction band mobility. So. And you can write them in this form and so on. So, so mobility when the trap limited conduction prevails, uh, and we assume a exponential tail state density. So the mobilities are somewhat limited when this is what happens. Yeah? So, so it's very important to make sure that the tail state densities are as low as possible. And good values of tail state densities are like 10 to the 17. And that gives you, you know, that means the Fermi level is more, you know, Fermi level moves closer per unit gate voltage to the conduction band and you get better conduction or better mobility. And uh, so at a sufficient gate voltage then, if the gate voltage enters the conduction band, so you can see what happens is, you know, it's like a, a reservoir, you know, of electrons, so they, do, they percolate much easier. And, uh, you know, they're not really uh, stopped by these, you know, sort of the uh, potential barriers. And there you can again describe the uh, percolation conduction, uh, it's in a similar form. And, uh, and, uh, Assuming you have a Gaussian distribution of these uh, potential fluctuations, uh, you can get, you know, these mobilities that you can get in the material uh, at these, this type of gate voltage is much, much higher. So. Now, so this also means that, you know, uh, because of the fact that, you know, this is where the insulator is, this is where the gate voltage is, you can design, depending on the voltage drop across the insulator, you can choose materials for the, for the gate dielectric so that most of the electric field falls here. So you, by design, you can try and get percolation to dominate as well by, by reducing the voltage drop that you get across the, the, the gate dielectric. So a lot of design, device design things that you can do to enhance the, uh, the conduction and the mobility in the material. So, so this is a summary and uh, basically all I wanted to say is regardless of whether you have a, a trap limited conduction case or a percolation conduction, the mobility is just, you know, a power law. So it's K times some coefficient times VG minus some threshold. So the, the reason we do this is because, you know, we like to design circuits, yeah, systems. 
And it's very nice that when you deal with a device, you extract parameters that are very easy to, to implement into some kind of a you know, design environment. And so with that, you can put together you know, uh, different devices and make circuits out of them and actually create the systems that you want. So one of the efforts that we are, you know, or one of the things that we are doing in Cambridge is to try and create this so-called design center where you know, uh, very much you know, involved in designing of flexible electronics or flat panel electronics and uh, you know, collaborating with the design tool companies like Silvaco who give us free access to their tools and where we come up with more compact models like this, which don't take time to you know, simulate circuit behavior. So. OK, so, uh, so you can see then, you know, with this kind of a compact model, you can extract the device from the measurements, you can re-simulate it, and you get pretty good ag agreement with whatever you've measured. And uh, so if you then look at the extracted mobility and plot it as a function of gate source voltage, you can then see the different regimes. So in this regime, that's when the transistor turns on, that's the threshold voltage, and you have the mobility that follows the power law, and then you have a second threshold where now the mobility becomes percolation dominant, which is again some sort of a power law. And you can extract parameters like this through very, uh, you know, <coughs> systematic uh, extraction. Okay, so let me now move into uh, the device application. Uh, so one device application I was telling you about is how do I then, you know, take this, take what I know with this and uh, the material property and turn it into an imaging array. So one of the things, you know, that, that the next generation displays that we all concerned about is human machine interaction, right? I mean, uh, uh, touch screens are very popular now, but people want, you know, something more than touch screens. And so this is one way where if you can embed uh, a camera, you know, an image sensor at every pixel, I mean, the display sees you also. So that was the goal of, of this project, which we did with Samsung. And uh, you've seen most of this. So I'm going to just, uh, I mean, the point here is that, you know, uh, the way I have sensitivity to the, to the visible is by introducing these vacancies, right? And uh, with that, I get reasonably good sensitivities in the blue and at the green as well. Red, red, uh, very little of the red. So, so here's the uh, device structure. It's a dual gate device. And uh, you can see this is where the bottom gate is. And this was a HESO material, hafnium indium zinc oxide. And that's sitting with a indium zinc oxide. And then you have the top gate, which is a transparent top gate, like ITO. So the, what the interesting thing about this device is that it's a uh, heterojunction. So this is a heterojunction phototransistor. And uh, you can see here the current voltage characteristics for, uh, for the different operating conditions. And, uh, and this shows you the responsivity for different wavelengths as well. So, so you can see then by you know, appropriate biasing, you can get good responsivity and, uh, and you know, good sensitivity to the, uh, to the uh, the, the, uh, the, the higher energy part of the visible spectrum. So what's nice about this, uh, the heterojunction? So, so one of the interesting things that we found with the heterojunction device is that, so you have the optical interaction layer. The optical interaction layer is the IZO. That's got a very high density of oxygen vacancies. So you get very good absorption within the IZO. And because I have a heterojunction that's biased, what I then do is I transfer all of this photogenerated electrons to the next layer. So I just move them over. And uh, that way that I prevent them from uh, re recombining as well. So, so basically you have these electrons that are whizzing around, you know, uh, many, many times before they die, essentially. So the photoconductive gain is very high in this device structure. So, so uh, and we were looking at, you know, what exactly is the cost of this and, and uh, and you know, finally, I think you know, we, uh, we published this and uh, you know, the reviewer had, you know, it was, took about a year and a half before it appeared, and the reviewer had quite a lot of interesting questions on what exactly causes this high gain. People are also seeing the same high gain. Photoconductive gain is not new, it's an old concept, but you know, it's very interesting to sort of implement this. People are doing that with graphene photodetector as well to try and get this high gain. So, 
So you have this you know, large photoconductive gain at the hetero interface. And this shows you a little bit more so as well. So, so you can see then that you have the, uh, this is a standard absorption curve uh, within the IGZO layer. You can see that you have significant absorption of the vacancies in the IZO. And then these photogenerated electrons then get moved over to the GIZO layer. And that's where they basically whiz around the uh, terminals. So, uh, so that's the kind of device structure which, you know, of course, it's very nice to have big companies, you know, fine-tuning the material for you and, and uh, you know, depositing it, making the array, doing all the lithography. So, so, so this sort of explains a bit more on the, uh, the whole idea. So the gain, so the gain is the, defined as the uh, lifetime over the transit time. So if the uh, lifetime, and the lifetime depends on recombination. So if you prevent recombination, this becomes a large value. And the transit time is a constant, depending on source, drain, channel, distance. So, so by, uh, by moving it over to a different layer I, and keeping them away from holes, I've basically enhanced the lifetime. And uh, how do I, you know, I can, of course, you know, in a, in a real operation, in, a, in an array where you do imaging at a certain frame rate, what I then have to do is destroy this lifetime. And I do that with this positive gate pulse. So I bring the gate pulse up, you know, quickly zap it to the positive voltage. And what? Yeah. Then what happens is, uh, you know, I, uh, this is the, the sort of gain that, that I generate. And uh, so, uh, so essentially, you know, the whole localization helps a lot because, you know, the electrons don't readily recombine with the holes. The holes are all trapped, not available. And so, uh, so with this, then, you can then, I'm going to skip this, put them in an in a, in a array. So, so here you have a display, this is a liquid crystal display, where the row decoders are, the column decoders. And uh, you have these usual RGB patterns. And what you do is you introduce the sensor. So this is the heterojunction device that sits there, photo sensor. And uh, basically the, the photo sensor part looks like this. So this is my photo transistor, the heterojunction photo transistor. This is my usual, you know, the rest of it is very usual LCD kind of driving circuits. I amplify that as well. And then here's my sampler. So I select it based on the bias that I give here. And uh, so, uh, so yeah, so this array was made and, uh, and uh, you know, basically with a light pen you could write whatever you want on the, on the screen and so on, so. Right, so, uh, so yeah, so, uh, uh, so this was, well, this was made by uh, Samsung and they worked with these oxide materials and now we all find that the oxide materials are actually giving a lot of problems as well, so, and I'll show you why in the next few slides, yeah. Okay, so the last, the last part I thought was to spend, you know, a few slides on the, uh, the circuits that we ma managed to make on, 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 on paper substrates. So this is the collaboration of the Portuguese group. And, uh, and basically what we were going for was, you know, low power consumption circuits. So using CMOS type architectures. And uh, the idea was eventually to have a good integration medium with newspapers, magazines, and, and basically low cost, recyclable, green, all the nice words that, you know, you need to use these days. So. Okay, so this is the device structure. The difference here is the paper is not a substrate. The paper is a dielectric. So, so you put the uh, gate on the other side of the paper and uh, the source and drain are then patent on the, on the opposite side. And uh, with this, you know, there was one area where oh, they, 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 these devices were adjacent to each other on the, on the paper substrate. So there was tin oxide, which is a P-type material. Um, and that was combined with the gallium indium zinc oxide, which was the N-type material. And the paper, you know, what is interesting and what I actually found quite interesting with the paper is that it's very fibrous. You know, so there are regions where the paper is thick and there are regions where the paper is extremely thin. And the material that you deposit on the paper is discontinuous. So that's uh, sort of very interesting. So, and uh, you can see that it became like a mesh. You know, this sputtered material appeared to be looking like a mesh on the, on the, on the paper substrate. And, and because of this, the effective capacitance was actually very high you know, because of this uh, 
fibrous nature of the paper. So the transconductances we were getting were as good as what you would get in a Pentium transistor. I mean, that was something I didn't expect. Uh, you know, thinking back, it's obvious because I have very, very thin layers or very, very thin areas uh, of the paper, you know, which uh, give, give rise to a, a nice high capacitance. So. So here's the uh, p-type transistor characteristic. So this is all done at room temperature. So room or a maximum 40 degrees Celsius. And you can see you know, the uh, transfer characteristics as well as the gate source leakage current. So uh, you know, the on-off ratios are not that great. This is more a conceptual thing. So we did this just to demonstrate that you can actually do CMOS, you know, complementary metal oxides. And uh, threshold voltages were about 1.4 volts. The uh, mobility for the, for the p-type was about 1.3, uh, better than silicon, 100 times better than silicon, and the sub-threshold slope was quite high, 6.9 volts per decade. On-off ratio, very poor, 10 to the 2, but again, like I said, it's more to do with you know, trying to show the concept of CMOS on paper. And uh, this was an n-type device. Device characteristics this time were much better. 2 volts threshold voltage, we got mobilities of about 23, sub-threshold voltage of still high, 3.1, and better on-off ratios and reasonably good device characteristics. Now, the gate source leakage currents were, yeah, you know, so you're looking at sub-microamps, so, you know, maybe several tens of nanoamps. And that's the, that's the current that flows through, the gate source leakage is the current that flows through the paper, uh, paper being the dielectric, the gate dielectric. So here you can see these are band diagrams that we sort of came up with, and uh, and uh, you can see uh, what happens when. So this is when Vg is equal to Vt, some kind of a flat band condition, and uh, and what you'll see is the paper has a low apparent dielectric constant and a very large apparent thickness that helps you uh, a lot in terms of getting good transconductance, and the fibrous nature of the paper gives you large capacitance. And this is you know, due to ion migration, formation of double layers, electrochemical double layers. And the sort of capacitances we got were about 40 nanometers, oh, sorry, nanofarads per centimeter squared. And uh, which is you know, better than about what you would get with 250 nanometer silicon nitride used in amorphosilicon TFTs. And so here's the inverter. So you can see reasonable inverter characteristics. So you can see the, the P-type transistor sitting there, huge, right, to get the uh, you know, reasonable performance uh, and the currents to flow because of the low mobility. And this was a much smaller N-type device. And uh, so this is the voltage transfer characteristic, and this is the current that flows. Oh, sorry, this is the gain that you get from, you know, from the device. So the gain isn't a, isn't a very sharp peak, but you can still use the gain for some sort of analog circuit application as well. So. And using that and, you know, based on what we extracted from the first inverter, we came up with different sort of analog digital CMOS building blocks. So, so you can see the different sort of gate arrangements that you can do, including transmission gate, NOR gates, NAND gates, and everything else. Right, so I think I can conclude, yeah? So, uh, so you know, so looking at these oxides, the primary instability mechanism is electron transfer, uh, trapping in gate dielectric, but these are short recovery times, as you saw. So these were dark stability experiments. And then you showed, you know, we saw the light-induced instability, which gives very large recovery times, and this is due to the presence of, you know, oxygen vacancies, doubly ionized, and uh, very slow recombination times. But you can, with a positive gate pulse, you can try and eliminate this, force a recombination of the electron. So and that you know, helps you achieve high frame rates in imaging arrays. So that imaging array that you saw was operated at a frame rate of 240 hertz, which is not too bad, not too bad at all, given all the problems of the material. So, uh, no, so, like, so electronics gives materials very good hope in many ways, right? So, and uh, you have to live with these material deficiencies when you deal with low temperatures, so there's no, not much option. Really. Uh, photo TFTs, heterojunction channels are very uh, attractive. Uh, the nice thing about a transistor is that I've got a transistor sensor sitting next to a transistor switch. So that reduces the mass counts that I have to do or that I need to implement you know, imaging arrays or using different processes. So, so it becomes very compatible. So, uh, so in terms of 
Um, despite the better stability compared to a MOFAS, there's still a lot of compensation required in these devices. Uh, simply because, you know, they, they have imperfections in the stability and also recovery, you know, photo-induced instability and recovery. So I have to answer that question that I started with. So will they ever see the light? <laughs> yes, when if you can tune the material for absorption in the visible, and that's by introduction of oxygen vacancies, which, which then give you the sub-gap absorption, which then allows you to have them in imaging arrays. And with the uh, gate, sort of gate resets that you can provide to force a recombination of the material, you can have them operate at high frame rates, 240 for example. And no, because we'll, we'll, these things will take a while before it makes a product, I think. Uh, there are a lot of issues. Because you're sputtering, these are multi-component oxides, the variation in, you know, uh, in the uh, material composition over large areas. Now, when we talk about large areas, we're talking about Gen 8. And people are now dealing with Gen 10. And that means the substrate has to be even bigger than a king size bed. And to get uniformity over that large area uh, with this material using sputtering processes is not easy. Now, you can all, of course, argue that I have very good ITO over extremely large areas. Now, that's different. ITO is insensitive to small variations. So even if you have 5% 5, 5 variation over a large area, it doesn't matter. It's a passive conductor. But when you put a transistor, transistor sees you know, all the imperfections and shows up in terms of parameter variations in the device. So, so that's the big problem. When you use it as an active material in a device, it's different from a passive material like indium tin oxide. So. Then there is lifetime, then there's environmental degradation. You've got to passivate the devices, protect them from the environment. And uh, not sure if there's a solution, but you know, certainly in, in Cambridge, we are trying to develop uh, CVD-based oxide. So to try and get the right source gases and uh, see if there's a way of depositing this by plasma and then CVD as opposed to sputtering. Because PECVD is known to give you much better uniformity. So. And the entire industry runs on PECVD, you know, with this display industry. So, so let's see how and where we get with that. So. Now, uh, what do I do? Should I show some slides? On Very good. I, enough time for that? Right. Two minutes. Two minutes? Two minutes? OK. So I haven't been, and this is the sort of thing that I show a lot in China, actually, because we're trying to raise a lot of funds for the systems design center. So, so I, I'll show you the same slides and, uh, and uh, what, you know, that, that I've been showing to, to, to these guys. So, so this is the, uh, well, University of Cambridge. That's the famous bridge of size. I don't know whether anyone has walked over that. You know, a lot of tourists during July and August, September also. So the university has 17,700 students, 12,000 undergraduates, 5,000 postgraduates. And they cannot expand because uh, all admission takes place through colleges. Colleges have limited number of beds, so they cannot just grow. <laughs> so the university grows the research population, which is the postgraduates, but not the undergraduates. You know? So typical undergraduate classes are about 40, 40 students per class. That's what we have. And it's a general engineering program, so civil, mechanical, chemical, all of that sit in one engineering sort of faculty or department. department. And uh, it's got about 350 students they take on every year, and typically 10% drop uh, after the first year. And uh, then in the third year, they move to specialization. And uh, English, now the UK has a system where masters has now been folded into the basic undergraduate program. So you do the three years plus one, and the fourth year is the masters which is all coursework and a five-month project, not a thesis, just a five-month project. So, so you've seen, uh, this is the famous uh, King's College, uh, built in 1200 something. So the university is uh, 800 years old. So a few years ago, they, last year, they celebrated the 800th anniversary. And there are about 31 independent colleges, six schools, uh, arts and humanities is one, humanities, social sciences, physical sciences, biological sciences, medicine and technology. I don't know how medicine and technology got put together, but that's, that's how it happened. So. so that's when the university sort of originated. Then you have this thing with uh, Newton, the principles of mathematics, that came out in uh, 1686. Then in the 1700s, you have the philosophy. 
And the guy who started the engineering was in 1875, this James Stewart. So that's when engineering was started. So these are the uh, different schools. Um, arts, humanities, humanities, social sciences, physical sciences, biological sciences, clinical medicine, and technology. So this is where the engineering department sits you know, in technology. So, so under uh, School of Technology, you have five departments. So engineering is one. And, and this is the, and because this department of engineering is so hard to compare, you know, engineering with electrical engineering or engineering with mechanical elsewhere and so on. So, so it always gets ranked number one in the UK for engineering. So, and uh, and then this chemical and bio, biotechnology. The, then there is the computer lab, very interesting lab. So this is where they do all the software. It's all funded by Microsoft. Microsoft, I think, spent about seventy million pounds, <coughs> and they had two buildings. So one of them is the William Gates building, which Bill Gates named after his father. So it's called William Gates. And uh, so a lot of work on smartphones, apps, and stuff like that. So that's where all the hardware of electrical engineering is taking place, interestingly enough, in computer science. Then you have the Judge Business School. So that's combined with the School of Technology. And uh, then you have the Cambridge Program for Sustainable Leadership. So a good collaboration, and this is where I am actually, this is the Center for Advanced Photonics and Electronics. This building was built entirely by industry, 100%. So industry owns the IP that comes out of that building. <laughs> they have access to all the IP, first rights of refusal. So, so it's 13 million pounds of, uh, that's what the building costs. And I was telling Arthur earlier, every, in, in, you know, in the UK, every building must have a 15% budget dedicated to the arts. So the arts in this case are these water waveguides, which at night they, you can have the waveguide lit up and you can see all the light diffusing away from the sort of the water beam. So that's the sort of art that's associated with this. So this building is right next. So if you go to the uh, right of this, that's where the Cavendish labs are. And uh, still, there's still a few people left. Uh, Josephson's still alive, by the way. He's 70 years old, he still cycles. You know, Josephson Junction, yeah, he's still there. And uh, who else? Mott died years ago. So. Well, Mike, Mike Pepper, of course, missed the price very closely. So, <laughs> yeah. And, uh, and, and the, uh, <laughs> the interesting thing is that the old Cavendish used to be in the center of town, right? And ever since they moved to this part of town, they said the Feng Shui became very bad. So they stopped winning all these Nobel Prizes. <laughs> Okay, so within engineering, uh, plus the nanoscience center, there is, you know, solid state electronics, energy conversion, power, photonics, sensors, optoelectronics. So all these three, uh, these three things are housed in one building, so interaction is quite good, very high. And so normally a proposal has 15 names on them. And we, you know, basically they cover quite a broad range of expertise. So the way we do it is if I get half a postdoc from one proposal, half from another, and this is how I build up my research team. And in a year, we submit about 15, 20 proposals anyway, so yeah. Okay, so these are all the, the guys who funded the building, including Mickey Mouse. Disney's got quite a huge sum of money they paid towards, and then Jaguar more recently, so. Okay. Yeah. Uh, thanks, first of all, for great talk, lots of work, very visionary kind of work. Uh, one question I have is about this uh, CMOS uh, yeah. uh, that you showed. Well, normally it used to be that you know you couldn't get really a good P-channel in these right. devices. So was it just uh, regular IGZO uh, undoped, or they were doped differently? How did you get this? Yeah, it was tin oxide. Tin oxide is intrinsically P-type. Yeah. Yeah. So, so that's what we use. Two different, two different materials. So they're shadow masked. Okay. Yeah. So, but the single material won't do it. Yeah. You have to have two different materials. Okay. And it's still a very uh, kind of vibrant area. Osono, I know, is working a lot on, you know, trying to even convert single materials to have ambipolar behavior and so on. But this is exclusively tin oxide. Yeah. Like the humidity impact? Um, no, 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 it's just uh, none of that yet. No, they, they would require passivation and, and so on. Even glass requires that. 
you know. These oxides are sensitive to humidity, so they have to be passivated very well. Correct, yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Sorry, but you said you used to what? I use paper as a subject for my, for the supercomposter I found. Oh, as a carrier? Yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. So the the, the uh, humidity is very important. If you don't control very well, yeah. or yeah, yeah. very well, it's detrimental to your performance. Dielectric constant varies a lot, yeah, um, because of the moisture. Back in the days, so I was thinking of TCOs, people were very concerned about crystalline materials because right. fundamentally yeah. you don't get those bumps in your potential yeah. diagram That's that right. cause a lot of That's right. electron scattering. Yeah. So what is the driving force to make amorphous? Is it just mm. a flexibility issue? Mm. What's, what's the problem with order is the re variation in order. <laughs> yeah. Uh, that's the fundamental problem. Right. So by making it amorphous, I don't worry about order. I don't have grain boundaries to deal with. I get better so uniformity. Right. So as, as soon as they become crystalline, I have, I've, 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 I've lost control on how, you know, what, what goes into the grain boundaries. Yeah. But you still sort of have grain oh. boundaries in a way. You have local domains. Yeah, but processing temperatures are also different, right? Crystalline material requires higher processing temperatures, generally speaking. So, But the amorphous is normally what we like, very much so, you know, in, 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 in depositing, when it comes to depositing over very large areas. So a lot of the processing is then aimed at getting the most homogeneous distribution right. of those ions within the material. Right, because transistors are ultra-sensitive to small variations, either in thickness or in material composition or whatever. Like you saw, right, ITO can vary by 10%. It won't show up in the, uh, you know, it's just a current carrying conductor. Right. As long as it's optically, as long as optically transparent between 90 and 95, I don't care about it. Yeah. But the transistor shows, shows variations in device behavior. In this case, the time it takes to free up is much, much shorter than the time it takes to go back. In this case, because of the nature of the material. In silicon, it's not the case, but in this material, it is. Silicon will be approximately the same. Yeah, you can. Close enough, close enough. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, what, in, what is the impact on the pixel pitch? Basically, a phototransistor eats part of the pixel space, and to get a high gain, you need to have high W or L, I guess, which, mean, which means basically you need mm. to eat like, a lot of space for this. This one is more, uh, this was just fooling around, you oh, know, okay. putting the uh, image sensor with the LCD display because that really affects the resolution. Yeah, yeah, right. So what you can do is scatter the uh, scatter the uh, camera, just distribute it over a screen. You don't need high resolution camera facilities for that, right? right? Now the gain comes from the material. It doesn't come from geometry. The gain here that I showed comes from the material, not geometry. You want to shorten the. The channel length was very short. Yeah. The channel length. Uh, yeah. yeah. Okay. Is that what you mean? Yeah. Yeah. It's still yeah. in the area. Now the gain here was ten. To, it's about a million mm -hmm. in this one. Yeah. But if you uh, doubled the channel length, oh no, sorry, let's say you increase channel length by a factor of 10, I, I got, got 100,000. So because Still not again, bad. you don't care much about Correct. It. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, no further questions. I'll ask you to join me in thanking uh, Dr. Nathan.